foundational information that uh, is very valuable. So with that, uh, take it away, Alex, and thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Um, as Steve said, my name is Alex Sinclair. I'm a, a design engineer here with Applied Engineering, and we've got uh, FEA overview and best practices this morning. And so with that, we can kind of dive right in here. Uh, what are we going to go over today? Well, um, first, I guess we should touch a little bit on who this presentation is really for. And this, this presentation is really geared towards, uh, you know, new ana analysts and, and engineers who are not necessarily educated on the topic, um, but hopefully you're familiar a little bit with FEA and some of its capabilities. If you're not, um, don't get too held up with that. We will cover some of those things as we go through. And so it should, uh, just like Steve said, be a good uh, fundamental foundation on you know, how FEA works and, and how we kind of look at that from a practical standpoint and from a user standpoint. Uh, again, we'll go over uh, the fundamentals and, and we'll get into the FEA process um, in detail and a lot of the general steps and some of the considerations that we need to be aware of uh, for those steps. We'll take a little bit of a, a look at best practices um, things that I typically do to set up robust and, and compu computationally inexpensive models. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll even highlight, you know, some of the challenges and some of the things that prevent us from, from carrying out, you know, quality FEA in, in certain situations. So with that, let's jump right in. Okay, so let's start with a question. Uh, what is FEA? And, and I think everybody probably knows that FEA stands for Finite Element Analysis. And what FEA really is is a, a numerical tool uh, that allows engineers and designers uh, to solve mathematical problems. And there's quite a few applications of FEA, and just to name a few, uh, we've got structural, static structural, which is the focus you know, of this webinar, uh, but we can apply FEA to, to many different problems, uh, including, but not limited to, you know, modal and vibration, heat flow, fluid flow, electromagnetics, and we can even compound some of these different, um, different genres, you know, all under one umbrella and one simulation. And so we're talking about uh, finite element analysis here. And so why don't I, th I think it's important to define, you know, what exactly a finite element is. Um, so to answer that question, you know, a finite element um, or finite elements plural is basically a network of elements that we are using to approximate a given geometry. And so you're going to hear this word approximate uh, come up quite a bit through this presentation. Uh, and, and that's because finite element analysis is not an exact solution. We are approximating some type of problem that we are trying to solve. Um, and there is approximation built into every step of the FEA process. And, and that approximation can be minimized and be very accurate, you know, given the right considerations. And so back to the, back to the finite elements, um, basically we're using a network of finite, element, finite elements to, uh, to model or approximate some geometry. And I've got some pictures of some wrenches here. Um, that approximation that we use those finite elements to make, you know, can be, you know, very coarse or can be very fine. And so the more finite elements that we use to approximate that geometry, typically the more accurate our simulation will get. And you can see that uh, with these wrenches here. Uh, the top left wrench is, is modeled with very few elements. And so you can see the coarseness. And then we get more fine as we go down. And, and we call this network of finite elements a mesh. You'll commonly refer um, to the discretized geometry as a mesh. Okay. Let's talk about uh, just some general FEA considerations um, so we can kind of understand uh, FEA just a little bit more. Um, and again, uh, FEA is, a, is an engineering tool. And we can use this tool uh, to better understand our products and make informed decisions, typically downstream from product design. Um, again, there's product or there's approximation uh, integrated into every step of FEA, and we'll we'll get into that in, in each individual step. And I, I really want to highlight that that doesn't mean that FEA is not useful. Uh, FEA can be extremely useful in a lot of different scenarios, and we'll highlight some of those as we go on uh, as well. Um, but it is important to recognize that there is approximation built in, and that we're not dealing with an exact solution here. Um, and something very important, and, and you'll hear this tossed around um, a lot. Uh, with FEA, uh, with FEA guys, and that is that that FEA is not really a substitute uh, for good judgment um, and, and product testing, you know, things like that. It's it's really a tool to help us better understand our products and uh, to add value to our products. Um, and we can kind of go over uh, the design cycle a little bit. Uh, and this is really one area that we can really 
add or use FEA and simulation to add value uh, to our products. And so our typical design cycle, you know, is going to start with our detailed design. You know, we might conduct some design reviews and, and, and iterate a little bit internally until we're comfortable um, with our models. And then we're going to move on to, to building. Uh, that could be prototyping or, or even building production units, depending on you know volumes and what our goals are and things like that. And we'll finally we'll either send this out to the field, you know, for operation, or, or maybe we'll do some testing or, or some some product validation in the, in the shop, or maybe we'll test it in the field. Um, and if we if we start learning things this far downstream, you know, during building and testing, you know, that'll cause an iteration loop, and we'll have to go back to design to make improvements. And so. Once one area that FEA really adds value, like I mentioned, um, is kind of shortcutting that loop. So if we can go from design to analysis and then back to design, that can add a lot of value by saving, you know, a lot of resources, both time and financial, um, you know, by saving uh, some of those cycle times. And uh, again, FEA's, you know, it's really not a substitute for good judgment um, in product testing. You know, it can add a lot of value, and and in some cases we can kind of mitigate, you know, doing doing some some of that prototyping and things like that. But anytime we are uh, working with you know a product that you know is going to have somebody standing on it or something like that, we're always going to want to do a little bit of testing. But FEA, you know, again, can be very valuable there. Another thing that you might hear a lot of times when you're working with FEA, especially if you don't have a experience analysis, or maybe even if if you do, he might toss this this phrase around, but uh, garbage in equals garbage out with FEA. And so if we can't properly define our analysis, then we cannot trust the results that come out. Um, you know, in this in this day and age, most of our, our CAD programs have built in FEA tools and the ability um, to run CAD and, and being proficient in CAD skills does not translate, you know, in the ability to effectively carry out uh, FEA. And so uh, I, I think it's very important to to have a general understanding of how FEA works and, and a foundation in structural mechanics, you know, can also be, you know, very useful in, in helping to, to verify and validate some of these models. And so uh, I've got to, I've got a little um, little little study here, uh, kind of an example of, of a poor FEA performance. And so I don't know how to pronounce this. I think it's a Swedish word, but the, the, the Sleepner A offshore oil platform, and that's sunk in 1991. Uh, and when they when they went through and conducted the safety review and, and the um, the failure you know study on why that oil platform sunk, uh, it turns out um, and in the picture there we can see the ballast that's it's kind of holding it's kind of an animated little gif but the the ballast that's actually holding that oil platform up and those uh, those ballast tanks were stabilized by what was called a tri cell and so I have a, an image of the tri cell that's placed in between those ballast tanks there. And it turns out that the FEA that was done on that tri-cell uh, underpredicted the shear stress by 47%, and that was enough to cause failure of that tri-cell, which led to the total economic loss of over $700 million um, in 1991 dollars uh, for that oil platform. Uh, following the failure and, and the subsequent failure study and review, uh, they re-performed the, the finite element analysis um, and, and properly set it up, and they did predict failure uh, of the tri cell, and so this is kind of a catastrophic example of, you know, FEA gone gone wrong. Uh, so with that being said, um, I don't, I don't. My point isn't to to scare anyone away from FEA, but just to just to know that um, making decisions based on FEA data can have consequences, and so we want to uh, we want to fully understand these models and how they're working. And and so I guess with that being said, we'll jump right into the fundamentals. And so the next two slides are going to be. Uh, a very high overview of the first day in an academic FEA course. Uh, basically, the mathematics behind, you know, a linear elastic FEA model. And so, let's let's jump right in. Um, and so, you can see on the screen here, we've got F equals KD. Uh, that F is a vector of element nodal forces. Uh, the K is the element stiffness matrix, and the D is the vector of elemental uh, nodal degrees of freedom. And so. Um, basically, this is the equation that your, your finite element algorithm is solving. And so every, everything that we add into the model, whether it's geometry, whether it's forces, you know, different boundary conditions, um, we're changing the mesh, those, uh, those are going to impact these equations that the model is going to solve. And so we can think about this, this vector of element nodal forces. That's going to be the, you know, some of the boundary conditions that we're applying, like forces or pressures. 
Um, and that's going to represent the forces at all of the nodes in the model, right? So we're discretizing or we're meshing the model with finite elements. And so there's going to be nodes on each element. So what we're really dealing with here is the position of all those nodes and the forces that are, that are transferring from node to node. Uh, the K is the element stiffness matrix, and that's basically made, uh, that's generated when we, when we mesh the model. And so changing the mess will change the K matrix. Our material properties are also built into the K matrix. So depending on, you know, what material we're using, um, this is linear elastic. So we're probably, you know, kind of sticking straight with, uh, you know, non-yielding metals uh, for this example. Uh, but that's all generated and populated, you know, when we mesh and when we add our material properties. And then these are our vector of elemental and, and nodal degrees of freedom. And so that's, you can think of that as uh, basically the nodal displacements, right? So where are our nodes at in space? What is their position? And when we apply load, how does their position change? So that's actually what we solve for when we solve and we, we, we click the solve button in the software. We are going to solve for the displacements um, and the nodal positions of each and every node in the model under the loading that we've we've provided, okay? And uh, here I've just got kind of an example. Um, a lot of the FEA models that, that I've worked with, I mean, we can have millions of nodes in those models. And so we can get a pretty lengthy list of equations. And so this is kind of what those equations look like. It's just your standard uh, linear algebra matrix equation. And so again, uh, I want to re-highlight that uh, it's the nodal displacements that we're solving for when we hit the solve button. And when we get those nodal displacements, um, we can apply those nodal displacements into our, our material constitutive equations, right? So I've got uh, the nodal displacements uh, circled here for you. And so these are, these are the, the constitutive equations for a linear elastic uh, metal. And so we can use those nodal displacements to calculate our strains, okay? And then we can use our Neo-Hookian material behavior to calculate our stresses from our strains. And so we've got our normal strains on the left and our shear strains on the right, okay? So again, this is kind of uh, just a brief overview. You know, when you're clicking around in the model and adding different things, it's, it's, it kind of just gives you an idea of, of how you're conditioning, uh, you know, these equations uh, to be solved by, um, your, your FEA algorithms and your, and your software. So let's move on. So I, I did mention um, that we're kind of focusing on linear FEA, but I will, I will briefly touch on, you know, some nonlinear aspects. And, and the first one is, you know, how can we make a model nonlinear and what does that exactly mean? And so there's, there's several sources of, of nonlinearities for structural analysis. And the first one, uh, the first one is geometric nonlinearity. Uh, geometric nonlinearity occurs when we have large deflections or rotations uh, present in our in our finite element model due to the loading, right? So if we're deforming quite a bit or rotating quite a bit, um, we'll have a geometric nonlinearity due to that. And, and what that really does to those equations is that K matrix basically will need to be updated uh, based on the deflection. And so we'll have to use an iterative solution process to solve that. And we're not going to get too much into um, you know, these nonlinear topics, but I just, I just want to highlight, you know, some of these different things that do make our models nonlinear. Uh, contact is another big one. So anytime we've got any kind of frictional contact or frictionless contact, um, those are going to make, uh, those are going to generate contact equations and those are going to be nonlinear. And so that's going to cause an iterative solution process. Um, and the last one, and, and probably the most common that people would think of uh, is our material nonlinearity. Uh, so if we've got, you know, if we're looking at metals, you know, post yield or or different plastics or hyperelastic materials, um, or even or materials that exhibit hysteresis properties, um, hysteresis is is a phenomenon of a material to absorb energy under cyclic loading. Um, so modeling those type of properties, that's all going to, you know, uh, turn out to be nonlinear solutions. And so I've got a uh, a graph on the upper right here of of uh, our typical a metallic stress strain curve. And I, I have this in here just to highlight um, that typically we're used to engineering stress strain when we're, we're in the lab and conducting, uh, you know, material tests, or even if we go, you know, on the internet and look for some material test data, typically we're going to find, uh, you know, engineering stress strain data. Um, and, we, and we all know that, that uh, engineering stress strain data differs from true stress strain data because it doesn't take into account uh, the reduction of, of cross-section during the test so that material is deforming 
and that, uh, that, that red stress strain curve there is not taking that uh, reduction in cross-sectional area or, or deformation into account. Um, and when we're, when we're working with FEA, we want to capture that, right? We need to capture the realistic material behavior and integrate that into our model. And so we need to be using uh, true stress and strain if, we're, if we want to integrate you know, a nonlinear material model um, as far as the metals go. Uh, we talked a little bit, um, you know, about these these nonlinear uh, issues, but or or ways we can we can build nonlinearity into our model. And really, what I wanted to highlight with that is, you know, what is the consequence for having a nonlinear model? And and I, I mentioned this as well. And and that's just that we have an iterative solution process. And what that really means is is that we can't directly solve our model anymore. It's not a it's not a simple algebraic equation that we can just solve for the single variable that's left in the problem. Uh, we have a nonlinear set of equations, and so we have to use iterative solution, which basically means we're going to guess and check at it. And so what the algorithm will do is it'll guess at a solution, and then it'll solve based on that guess, and then it'll make a new guess. And it'll keep doing that until the difference between guesses is very small. Um, and, and typically, it's some kind of error criteria in there. And once we've, once we've minimized that, you know, the difference between the two guesses, we will consider that a converged solution. And that, uh, that that is the answer to our nonlinear solution. And so really what that costs us is, you know, uh, model robustness. You know, it's going to take a lot longer to solve these models. You know, they may not converge. There can be issues, you know, actually converging uh, the models. And it's, you know, our computational expense is going to be much higher. And so we always, you know, want to try and find a good balance between, you know, accuracy and computational expense, um, especially if we don't have unlimited resources to solve these problems. Let's get into um, kind of the process of, of FEA just a little bit and, and how we get started with that is, is talking a little bit about analysis definition. And I think this is a very important step um, just because we really, you know, we really need to think about everything before we start the analysis and we need to clearly define, you know, our goals and expectations so that we know how um, we can carry out the analysis and, and that we can have some expectation on what the results are going to be. If we're blindly setting up FEA models, uh, you know, we might um, get some data that we can't necessarily trust or, or maybe we don't even know that we can't trust it, you know, and that can, that can be a big issue. And so we, we want to spend some time and, and understand, you know, what we're trying to get out of the analysis, you know, what kind of downstream decisions that we're, we're looking to make with that data and, and even what our expectations are. Um, and this is going to tell us, you know, whether or not that, that the analysis is going to be value added. If we feel comfortable, we can get results that we can make downstream decisions with. Uh, then we can determine, you know, whether or not those those decisions can add value. And so determining the strategy for carrying out that analysis, you know, is very important. And also, you know, taking some steps to see how we can validate or verify our results. So whether that's, you know, take a look at some some classical analysis techniques, or or maybe we need to test the the, the parts a little bit and see if we can get, you know, some kind of correlation out of that. That that can be very important. A lot of times, what I'll do. Uh, for sure on every model is at least calculate reaction forces uh, with your traditional statics and make sure uh, the output forces on the FEA model you know are exactly you know what what I'm getting on the statics that's usually the case um, unless you have some really complicated geometry we should be able to get pretty close on, on those output reaction forces at our uh, you know our boundary condition locations um, and then and then the last planning step that's that's also very important is you know what assumptions and simplifications can we make, and and these are really a can be a difficult um, thing to kind of nail down with FEA, and we'll talk about these in detail. But um, the assumptions, really, what we're talking about there is is can we simulate real world loading? You know, can we can we can we you know accurately capture how this thing is loaded or going to be used in the real world? Um, same thing with boundary conditions. You know, where are we going to take the load out? You know, can we take it out? You know, just like it's going to be taken out in the field. So sometimes these models can be um, more of an approximation in in that regard if we're if we're not sure exactly how to to apply those boundary conditions. And so this can be you know a real important consideration. And, and we'll talk more about simplifications to the model uh, moving forward. I'll briefly touch on the analysis workflow here. Um, this is just going to be kind of the general steps of setting up an FEA um, model and, and carrying out some analysis and. We'll get into each individual step um, in detail, you know, on the on the subsequent slides here. 
So we're always going to start uh, with some kind of geometry. Now, whether that's a piece part, maybe we've got an assembly. Um, we're going to need to do as much simplification and, and prepping that geometry for the finite element process as possible. And so a lot of times with models that I've worked with, we'll spend up to 90% of our time, you know, just prepping the geometry, you know, for the analysis. Actually applying the constraints and things like that is fairly straightforward um, as far as, you know, clicking around in the software and, and doing that. And so really prepping geometry is, is what's going to take the longest. One. And again, we'll get into that more. Uh, the next three steps are kind of interchangeable. They all happen at, at very similar time points, but we're going to need to pick some elements. Uh, there's a lot of different types of elements we can use, and, and again, we'll get into that. Um, but it's important to kind of know, you know, some, what the different types of elements are and what the, what the consequences and drawbacks are, are for using different types of elements. Uh, we'll discretize the geometry, you know, we'll create our mesh. Uh, we'll approximate that geometry with all our finite elements. Uh, moving on to our connections, and this, again, connections could be made before we, we choose our elements. Um, but I've got it fourth here, and so if, we, if we're working with an assembly or some kind of more complicated geometry and we want to make some connections, uh, this is where we would do that. And following that, we'll apply our loads and boundary conditions, okay? And so these five steps together uh, basically are our, our pre-processing steps, right? We're, we're pre-processing the model. Uh, once we're done pre-processing the model, we'll go ahead and carry out our analysis. We'll solve the model. So that would be um, kind of the second overall step. And then our last step is the post-process. And that's where, where we take the displacements that we got from the analysis step and we actually post-process out our stresses and strains. Okay. So let's move into each, uh, each topic, you know, a little bit more individually and, and get into them. Um, so starting with the geometry and the elements, uh, I mentioned, you know, some simplifications. We, we always want to find a good balance between a, a simplified and robust model and, and accuracy, right? And so um, one thing that we'll typically do is we'll remove, you know, all non-structural components. Any component that, you know, doesn't have a load path or, or add to the stiffness of your assembly or model, we want to remove those, right? Because we don't want to be meshing those components uh, and increasing computational expense and complexity in our model. So, so we'll remove those. Uh, insignificant features, uh, I'll typically also remove things like small fillets, small chamfers, even small holes. Um, we'll remove those. Those take a lot of elements to capture that, that detail and, and those small curves and, and chamfers and things like that. And, you know, we might get some questions that says, hey, why would we remove those? Uh, you know, we know that we can get stress concentrations at sharp uh, points in geometry. If we take out our, our little fillet radiuses and, and chamfers, and we're going to have sharp, you know, corners in our model. And so really, uh, we're going to remove those, you know, just to increase the robustness of our model. And we can also still consider our model to be conservative, you know, if we remove some of those features. Once we've kind of, you know, determined that our model is robust and that we can easily solve it and we're getting results that make sense, you know, if we've got some concern areas in the model, you know, where there's maybe a high stress where there was a fillet radius removed or something like that, we can go back in and add those features, you know, where we need them. Um, I think that uh, that's a good kind of workflow, you know, in order to ensure that, that we're being as efficient as possible. Another, another bullet point here that we have is symmetry. And this is something that I see a lot. Um, it, it's ignored quite often uh, with new analysts. We'll, uh, we want to generate that pretty picture of the whole model, but really, you know, if our model has symmetry, whether it's, you know, axisymmetric symmetry or planar symmetry, we can start dividing that model, you know, in half or, or uh, the, the model here I've pictured, we could actually divide into a quarter. We can just keep a quarter of the model and apply a symmetric boundary condition. Um, that'll be much more computationally efficient and still accurate, right? It's still going to have the same accuracy as your form whole model. It's just going to take much less time uh, to solve. It'll be much simpler. So that's a, a very important consideration. Uh, the next next topic is a, uh, something that, that I tend to use quite a bit. Uh, and that's, we'll talk a little bit about solid versus shell elements. And I think uh, most of us, if we have carried out any finite element analysis, you know, in our in our CAD tools or, or even just, you know, in academia or, or wherever it may be, we typically use solid elements. So solid elements are great elements. Uh, they, they capture the greatest amount of detail and accuracy. Uh, but there are some drawbacks to using solid elements. Uh, first, they're very computationally expensive. Uh, 
right? If, we, if we're using solid elements, it's, it's very likely we're going to have a lot of solid elements. And that's because typically uh, we need to, to have multiple elements through the thickness of you know, any given component. So if we've got very thin components, we need to ensure that we have several solid elements through this thickness. And the reason for that is uh, it's, it's based on the degrees of freedoms in the element formulations, but basically uh, low order solid elements uh, only have three degrees of freedom. You've got your X, Y, and Z translations, and, and we won't get too much into that, but basically uh, what that means is that we have trouble capturing bending with solid elements if we don't have multiple layers of those solid elements. And so in comes our, our shell elements, and I, I tend to use uh, shell elements quite a bit, and in our simulation team here at Applied, uh, we tend to favor shells where possible. And a shell element is basically a 2D element. Okay, we're removing the thickness from play. The thickness is actually uh, compounded into the into the mathematics, you know, in the formulation of the element. So we're still uh, we're still capturing our thickness but we're using a 2D element to do so, okay? And shell elements are very accurate and they're very computationally inexpensive. Uh, the issue with shell elements is that it, it can be tough to know when to use them. There's no real rule of thumb. Um, I've seen some, some people try and, and put some kind of aspect ratio rule of thumb in, but it, it doesn't always make sense. And so really what I like to think of um, for when we use shell elements is, for the most part, all any sheet metal weldment or sheet metal parts will approximate using shell elements. Um, but anytime we're, we're dealing with parts that have large length and width, width dimensions compared to their thickness, um, granted that they have you know, some symmetry about the mid plane, we can, we can go ahead and shell those parts and, and use shell elements for, um, to approximate those. And I've got kind of an image here of you know, what a solid element and some shell elements look like. The shells are, are again, they're 2D, there's no thickness there. And so again, uh, very good. Shell elements are very good. They can be uh, a little tricky depending on what CAD software you use. And so you'll notice this, this presentation is not specific to any CAD software or, or FEA software rather. Um, but different, different softwares have different ways um, of approximating geometry with shell elements. And so depending on what software you'll use, you'll have to kind of um, look into how you can, you can accomplish that goal there. Um, and, and one, one issue you can run into that I'll kind of highlight is that when you, when you shell a part, you're basically removing the thickness uh, from play as far as the actual geometry is represented. And so that can create, uh, you know, if you've got two parts in contact and you shell them, they may no longer be in contact. And so a lot of times in your, in your built-in CAD tools, um, if you want to use shell elements, you might have to, you know, create a standalone model and a standalone assembly um, that's just for FEA. You know, and it's kind of unrelated from your actual product product geometry. Um, you'll create, you know, a custom model that that is just for FEA. Uh, some of your higher end softwares like Ansys, um, we can do a lot of geometry editing right built in with the software, and so we can actually reconnect those edges that came out of connection. Um, and so it all depends on again what software you're using. Let's move on to meshing. Uh, meshing meshing is very important, um, and if we don't have a quality mesh, this can cause uh, some solution accuracy. And so I've got a couple of graphs down here that, that show mesh convergence. And so on the left, uh, I guess I, it would be good to explain um, what exactly we're looking at here. And so this, this is the von Mises stress and, and displacement of a flat plate. Uh, it's, it, it's been shelled. It's a shell, flat plate meshed with shell elements. Um, and it's, it's constrained on the edges and then loaded in the middle. So very simple geometry, just a flat plate. Um, held down on the edges and, and, and loaded in the middle. And so these, these two graphs here are showing uh, the von Mises stress and the displacement versus how many elements we're using uh, to mesh that flat plate. And so we can see that the more elements we use, we can see that the solution is converging. And so basically what we want to think of here is, is solution accuracy. Now this isn't tied to, you know, whether our are the problem we're setting up really models a real world scenario. This is just telling us if our internal solution is converging on a specific value. And so um, on the left, we can see that as we use more elements, uh, you know, we're converging that von Mises stress at about 21,000 PSI. And on the right, as we use, you know, the same number of increasing elements, we're converging that displacement at 0 0.0124 inches. Okay, and we can see, especially with the displacement uh, excuse me, displacement, that 
you know, if we use a very small number of elements, we're going to get quite a bit of error. Okay, and so sometimes it's important to to conduct some of these mesh convergence studies and make sure that um, make sure that we are converging our solution, and that if we change our mesh a little bit, we're not getting a drastically different result. Uh, and so it's, it's important to understand that and, and make sure that we're trusting our models in that way. Now, one uh, one other kind of caveat to this, uh, and somebody may be thinking of this, but um, and that, that, that would be the presence of a, a singularity in your model. So singularity is, is somewhere in the model where we're basically, we have some load flowing through an element in the model and, and there's not much area or, or there's a sharp change in geometry that is causing the, the amount of geometry you're reacting that load to be very low. And so if we think about it in a, in a you know, axial stress scenario where we have you know, some force divided by the area, if that area is very small, our, our stress is going to go to infinity. Um, that's called a singularity and that can crop up from time to time in an FEA model. And, and typically how you know that you have a singularity is that no matter how many elements you have, that stress value in that spot is just going to keep rising and rising towards infinity. And so uh, we can talk more about singularities if, if people have questions, you know, at the end about those. Um, but they can they can be an issue um, in some models depending on you know your goals and, and expectations with the model. Let's talk a little bit about connections. Uh, connections are are more of an advanced topic uh, in FEA and, and understanding how connections work. We're we're going to cover a couple of the, the more simple connections um, and kind of how we can set those up. And so the first uh, the first connection and the most simple connection is is what we call uh, shared topology. And so really it's not even a connection, but, but I'm listening on the connection slide here. And merged topology is where we're basically going to uh, take bodies that are multiple parts and basically turn them into one part. So we can do this with shells or solids. I have some, some shells pictured here. Uh, in the left image, we can see the two plates come together and they're touching. And if, if you look closely at where they're touching, the, the nodal locations, right, where those lines come together, are not sharing nodes between the two parts, okay? And so if we wanted to bring those into contact, we would have to create a connection. Now, if we merge the topology or basically condense the two parts into one, like in the upper right picture, you can see that the two parts are now meshed together and they're sharing nodes. And so that's gonna transfer load through there, like the two bodies were basically one body. And, and a lot of times uh, the team here at Applied will we'll try and do this for, for weldments. You know, if we've got uh, multiple sheet metal parts that are coming together and being welded, we can merge the topology. Sometimes we'll have to do a little, you know, ge geometric editing to, to make that work. Um, but we'll merge the topology and that's a very robust and linear way uh, to approximate that geometry. And we do it quite often. Uh, moving down, down to the next connection, uh, we'll talk about bonded connections a little bit here. And so bonded connections are, are typically linear. We can think of a bonded connection as basically gluing two parts together. And, and how, and, and this kind of goes for all types of connections, but we're specifically going to focus on bonding, bonded connections here. But we'll typically, whether your software has you define the individual surfaces or not, sometimes it'll define them for you, but you'll, you'll basically be scoping a contact and a target surface. It could be edges or it could even be a vertex. Uh, you can bond all kinds of things together. You can basically bond anything to anything. And, and what we're really doing there is we're telling the software to glue those nodes together. And so how the software is going to work is it's, it's going to minimize penetration. So if we think of those contact nodes and elements on the upper surface there and, and the target surfaces on the bottom, the software is going to make sure that those nodes and elements have minimal penetration uh, on the other nodes and elements. And so we can kind of have some control um, over how that process works with our pinball radiuses. And so every every software has pinball radius inputs, whether it's, you know, some of them you have to go in and find a setting. Some of them you, you can specify, you know, fairly easily on the front end. Um, but our pinball radiuses basically will tell our software, you know, how much or, or how far out to look for elements and nodes to bond together. And so we can use that pinball radius um, to kind of tell the software like, hey, we want this to be a pretty fuzzy connection or no, we want this to be a pretty tight connection. Um, we want specifically these nodes and these nodes to be glued together. Um, and, and, and what we've seen in, in this picture kind of demonstrates it pretty well is that those pinball radiuses are pretty big, um, kind of shown compared to the geometry at least. And so where those yellow lines are, we can actually create 
you know, bonded contact between nodes that aren't actually in contact with each other. And so we can use that to simulate, um, you know, a little bit of a, of a excess well be that, that might be in there. So we can, we can transfer load, you know, from node to node that aren't necessarily real close to each other. Uh, you know, or we can we can condense those pinball radiuses down, and we can really limit you know the nodes that are transferring the load. And so, really, the take home uh, on these these connections is that we need to take some time and make sure that we're accurately modeling our load paths. Right, that's the most important thing to capture. Um, depending on the types of connections you use. You know, your, your connection stresses and strains may not be accurate, but as long as you're transferring the load through the geometry uh, and that load is able to get to the areas of interest, then you can rely on those results, right? And so, uh, again, that's, that's really the take home from this is to, we need to make sure to model our load paths appropriately. I think we've got a little bit more on the connections. Um, I'll just briefly highlight some other types of connections that are generally nonlinear. Uh, less stable and, and you know some of these require a little bit more of an advanced understanding um, and some of those examples include joints and I've got a picture of a joint on the bottom right and so what a joint really is is it we're constraining uh, some of the degrees of freedom on the selected elements and, and nodes on those elements so for example we've got a hinge picture here and so we've got uh, you can you can see the coordinate system on that hinge we're going to allow uh, that hinge to move on that blue axis of the coordinate system which turns out to be the z-axis and so we're, we're constraining, again, we're constraining nodal degrees of freedom with the joint. Uh, those can be a very robust way to set up some assemblies. However, typically with a joint, your, your stresses may not be accurate at, you know, at that joint location, but it's a very good way to transfer the load, you know, through that joint. Um, some more, you know, more accurate ways of modeling typical joints, whether it's, you know, pins and bushings, or maybe you just have general contact, like pictured in the upper right, we've got a cylinder and kind of an eye there. Uh, we can use frictional or frictionless contact to set those up, um, and then you know the those are quite a bit more complicated, and um, they're going to increase your computational um, expense when we're using those types of connections. So let's get into boundary conditions, and and this is a big one. Um, this this tends to be one uh, one area of finite element analysis that that can you know cause some issues or or some a little bit of pain anyways and in, in setting things up and so really what we need to take a hard look at is is can we accurately represent applied loads and boundary conditions right and so that's something that we should have absolute confidence in and we don't necessarily always need you know maybe we can't um, necessarily model the exact applied load or the exact boundary condition maybe we're not so sure um, but one other thing we could we could take a look at, you know, if we have trouble with that, is we could look at, you know, performing a comparative analysis. Maybe, uh, maybe you have an existing field tested design that's been in in industry for 10 years, and and you know it doesn't have any issues. Uh, we could always run, you know, some type of finite element analysis on that component, and then we can do a comparative analysis. Maybe you've made improvements to design. We can run the same loads and boundary conditions and, and do a little comparison. And then we can kind of say, you know, is it better or worse? And, and so that's something that we'd look at doing if we can't really mimic real world scenarios. Um, but just moving into some, some boundary condition considerations. Uh, a lot of times we see over constraints uh, being one major issue. And that's typically with fixed constraints. Uh, fixed constraints are, are provide a lot of stiffness to our models. They're, they're pretty easy and, and provide very stable solutions. So we tend to see those used quite a bit, but um, really a fixed constraint is, is rarely the right choice. There's not, you know, not very many connections or boundary conditions that are going to be infinitely stiff. Whatever you're connecting to or wherever you're taking out that load is probably going to give a little bit and, and be able to deform. Um, I've, I've carried out countless, um, countless FEA simulations that, you know, we compare the difference between different types of, of constraints versus fixed constraints and, and the fixed constraints always yield drastically different results. And, and I actually include an example uh, an example of that here, and so we've got uh, this is a this is a ramp that that I ran a study on, and so this ramp uh, this ramp is loaded in the middle. It's got a hinge point in the middle. It can it can fold in half there, and you can see those A and B tags on the end. That's where we're applying our our constraints. Okay, and so if we make A and B a fixed constraints, you know we've got a pretty stiff model. The load can transfer through there. 
uh, you know, relatively easily. And, and this is, uh, this is a, you know, a, a detailed view of that hinge geometry. Um, so we can see it's pretty cool. Uh, the stress isn't too high. And so something like this would, would give us a lot of confidence and say, hey, this, you know, this, uh, this product is, is going to be good. It's, the stress is low. Uh, no problem, right? Well, it turns out when we, you know, use some more realistic boundary conditions, um, the hinge, the hinge is an issue, right? We've got some really high stresses that go through that hinge. Uh, it turned out that this ramp was actually tested uh, with this geometry and it failed in two cycles of loading. And so we really want to make sure that we've got realistic boundary conditions and you know that we're that we're not tr necessarily trusting results uh, that, that have got the fixed boundary conditions. Um, in certain scenarios, fixed boundary conditions can be appropriate, but uh, like I said, in general, um, they can be you know a little overly stiff on our model. And so this is this is just a, a great example of that. Let's talk uh, briefly about failure criterions, and and this has got to do with you know our our post processing of our model. Um, you know, what, what are those pretty pictures that we're outputting actually telling us, right? We've got our, our and, and we're specifically focused on stress contours here and, and two very common stress contours that we'll output. Uh, one is the distortion energy theory, which is commonly known as von Mises stress. And, and we can see the envelopes, the failure envelopes to the right. Um, but von Mises stress is typically a very good predictor for, for ductile failure. But one, one shortcoming of von Mises stress is it doesn't differentiate between tensile and compressive stresses. Um, and, and those two types of stresses can, you know, be, have very different consequences on your geometry. Uh, for example, you know, if we were to uh, put, you know, a million pounds on a stack of paper and compress that stack of paper, you know, we might not necessarily do too much damage to the stack of paper, right? Um, but if we were to pull, you know, and pull on those sheets of paper, they would, they would rip at a much lower load. Uh, and that basically, what we're trying to say there is, is tensile stresses typically will cause a lot more damage to a model. Um, not to say that, that compressive stresses can't cause damage to a model, but uh, it can be very important to differentiate between the two types of stresses and understand, uh, you know, where the tensile stresses are and where the compressive stresses are, especially if we're, you know, dealing in cyclic loading. Um, if, we, if we've got some type of fatigue or reverse loading, um, the tensile and, and compressive stresses make a huge difference in that type of analysis. Uh, the second failure criterion that we briefly highlight here is, is the principal stress. And so that's commonly preferred for, for brittle material failures. And I've seen it used quite a bit to correlate um, when we take our, our products out into the test shop and, and, and put strain gauges on and, and do some, uh, you know, some field testing or, or what have you. We'll typically use material or principal stress and, and the direction of that principal stress to correlate with those strain gauge measurements. Um, if you have a, a strain gauge rosette in here and you're testing with strain gauge rosettes, you can uh, get a little bit better at, at comparing that to, to the von Mises stress, but that's uh, going to be a little harder to set up and, and additional expense to do that. So we can use principal stress to correlate with our strain gauge measurements in, in the test shop. Um, this slide really highlights uh, the advantage of FEA over classical analysis. Um, and I think it's really important to note before we get into this slide that, that FEA, again, is not a substitute for classical analysis techniques. Uh, in a lot, of, a lot of situations, we can use classical analysis um, to very accurately predict this, the stress state of our material. You know, typically, when the geometry is, is you know, fairly simple, FEA really comes into play when we've got complicated structures, you know, weldments or, or load paths, things like that. And that's be because FEA takes, you know, the variable stiffness of that complicated geometry into account. And so we can capture stress concentrations and we can see kind of how the load is flowing through the parts. And, and one thing that I, I like to kind of highlight is that um, load kind of flows through a part like water. And load will always follow the stiffest path through a part. And so we, that's why we use the water flow analogy. Um, if we're trying to get that flow, that water or load flow to go through a part efficiently, we want to make sure that, that it doesn't have to change directions too many times, right? If we're, if we're forcing that load to change directions as it moves through our components, we're going to get, you know, higher stresses and more 
uh, more stress concentrations in that geometry. And so that's just kind of a general design guideline. It, it doesn't have too much to do with FEA, but um, it is important to, to realize, you know, kind of how load flows. And then you can, you can use that knowledge a little bit when you're looking at the results of your FEA model to, to kind of, uh, you know, gauge, you know, how the load is moving through and, and you can use that information to help make, you know, downstream decisions on, you know, how to make improvements. And so it is important to, to understand that. Uh, and we talked about a lot of these challenges, um, but the main one being this real world loading and boundary conditions and being comfortable and confident uh, with those. If we can be comfortable and confident with, you know, our boundary conditions and our loading of our FEA models, you know, then it just comes down to the complexity of our model and, you know, how much uh, simplification and, and complexity that we want to incorporate. And so those are all things that we can easily tweak. Um, and so again, pre-planning and, and taking a look at, you know, what we want to do with the model, what kind of value we want to add, and, and, and what kind of information we have to ensure that, that we can be confident in our models. Um, again, I talked a little bit about comparative analysis. You know, sometimes we can use, use that to, um, you know, create an acceptable analysis. Um, talk a little bit, well, I don't know that we talked too much about, you know, certifying RFEA. Um, we, we highlighted it here, here and there, but again, we've got, you know, we've got our classical analysis and we've got, you know, we've got good judgments. Um, we can definitely take a look at reaction forces and then really we want to always make sure that if it's something that's, you know, is, has any kind of a safety concern, um, that we do some kind of, you know, testing on that, on that components. And, and I've got some cool images here of a tire testing machine. And this is actually a, a picture of a 7H7 on uh, their wing bending test, and so they've got a big fixture for the aircraft, and they're um, they're deforming the wings to a certain to a certain magnitude, and, and making sure that uh, those wings are are structurally uh, sound as far as uh, the deformation that they're applying. So that's uh, I guess uh, some of the ending slides here. Uh, if you are you know, if you do have a simulation program or you're looking to create a simulation program, ISO 9001 document R0013 can be um, can be valuable. Basically, it's it's the formal guidelines for setting up um, an analysis program as far as 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 quality monitoring goes. And then we've got ASME VV10. So VV is uh, the verification and validation. So that's kind of a guide for uh, you know going through and verifying and validating uh, your FEA model. Um, so that we can you know, have that confidence in the model. And so with that, um, that kind of concludes the presentation. And I've got a quick quip about applied here. Uh, we are 100% employee owned company. We like to think that we've got some good engineers on staff here, or at least Steve likes to think so. Um, we do try to be flexible with our customers and, and we like to help out in all kinds of different projects. And so uh, we, we do really enjoy doing that. Uh, we have done quite a few different simulation runs for varying customers. Um, we like to reduce, or a few things that we have uh, been able to do for our customers, I guess, reduce some prototype costs, uh, accelerate design cycles, that's a big one, um, decrease defect rates and product warning costs. You know, if we can, if we have uh, more information about our, about our products, then we can make more informed decisions on how to, you know, make improvements on those products, um, improve product safety or, you know, gain insight and performance uh, on how the, the structure behaves under load. Uh, all important things and, and things that we've been able to help our customers with. So uh, with that, I thank everyone for, for joining the webinar this morning. I've got my contact information here, uh, both email and my direct dial. If you have any questions, um, you can feel free to contact me at any time. But other than that, we can open up, uh, we can open up for questions if there are any. Nice work, Alex. Very good. Um, one question did come in via email that, um, Elaborate a little bit more on junk in, junk out, and how do you determine what the proper loads are? Uh, can you say that one more time, Steve? Yep. Um, the, an email came in with a question on how do you um, uh, understand junk in, junk out, and how do you how do you find out what the right loads are? Sure. Um, well. There's a couple of different ways we can go about looking at that. Um, I mean, it's always good to start uh, with, you know, your classical, um, you know, what are you designing the load to take or the structure to take as far as the loading? 
um, and, and getting a good handle for you know what your design requirements are. Uh, hopefully you have set those up uh, in your project. You know if you're maybe you've got a 10,000 pound load that that your product needs to handle. I mean that's where you would start is you know what your product is actually designed to do. Uh, the other thing that that we see a lot, um, and this is typically with you know some of our bigger customers and companies is is that they'll they'll create an iterative loop between you know simulation and testing and so they can they can do some testing and based on that testing they can kind of figure out uh, you know what loads that they're they're applying during tests and then they can go back and use those for FEA and kind of use an iterative loop to to refine how you're you're performing your FEA and, and how you can bring that together with your testing and, and create correlation there. Very good. Very good. Is there any more questions out there? I don't see any pop up on the chat line. So thank it. Thank you everybody for attending. Alex, you did a magnificent job. Um, your uh, understanding of FBA is fantastic. Um, we're we're very happy to have you on our team. Um, and I think that will be a wrap. I appreciated everybody for coming out. And uh, thanks again, Alex. Great presentation. And we have another. Uh, uh, present webinar starting at 11 on manufacturing efficiency. So thank you everybody. Appreciate it.